Number 8107, the water supply. What happened there? We were talking about selling any uh, requirements that we didn't need or make a market or... So that's on page 2 of 12, that's in general, number 8, item number 107. Just yes, it's just wondering how it's finished, time wise, what happened about it, and what could it be completed? Let's go back to 2013. Yeah, I just wonder. Yes. Whether they were done and dusted, I don't know whether we sold the water if we were talking about selling excess. I think just through the chair, the intention of uh, well, that decision and the comment don't completely align. So, no. council is working with Jacobs and uh, specifically with. Uh, one of their contractors, Jeff Kavanagh, on uh, the matter of water pricing, so that we can uh, take a case to some water to look at what the future is for water pricing. That decision, without studying it, will be more about, uh, I would imagine, um, temporary disposal of some of water allocation, I'm yeah. assuming. That is a topic that we tackle every year. Uh, usually when we get towards the end of the water year, there's an opportunity to uh, to take some temporary transfers <coughs> water that we're not going to use out of our 5,700 megalitre annual <coughs> allocation. And depending on the market circumstances, we can usually uh, come over a reasonable price for that water. That's something that we should be um, getting ready to act on early next year. But that old decision probably wants to come yeah, off. I think there was something to do with the pricing. We can't sell it at on the open market or something, we were restricted on. I think we were looking at that as well. Kerry might know more about that than I do. Uh, but I just thought, well, maybe it's done and dusted. Is it still current or should it still be? Look, the little bit I know is reviewed, I guess, at the just prior to the end of the water year, which is the same as the financial year. So just before the end of June, it's a review of council sector usage and uh, obviously uh, consideration of. Uh, uh, the winter season and whether or not they might need some. So, in effect, uh, the council does have the opportunity to carry water allocation over so they can carry it into next year. So, I think between Gerard and Peter Manning, they obviously make a determination about what, what, what sort of a year and what sort of usage there has been and, and decide about whether the pros and cons have actually disposed of that water. So, it's a fairly fluid decision that should be made sort of mid June. So, that Again, to the mayor, I think uh, a way to deal with that old resolution would be to provide some clarity around the process for uh, trading of water. How we deal with it, how we manage our water allocation. I think that would be enough to satisfy that decision. Sorry, Councillor Roll. Item number four, which is 27, it's on the first page, bottom of the first page, um, about the Asset management plans, road, road organisation. Um, just right down the bottom, it says allocation be made in budget for gravel depth checks. And, we, and this is another one that started in 2013, I think. Mm. Yeah. Can these be progress updated? Can you... Yeah, they can be. I think that uh, through the chair. Some of those issues are superseded by our present asset management actions. And if we can put a comment in there that respects that old decision and what was to be achieved, and then redirect uh, Council's attention to the later item around asset management per se, then we can take that line item down. That would be a good way to tidy it up. I think there are some other action items in there too that have a bit of currency mm -hmm. that are probably ready to be closed out, but probably just need that authorization to do it. Well, yeah, because one of the, the next one is um, uh, an update on the um, number 11, which is the human pedestrian bridge. And that's from March 
16. Mm. Um, matters unresolved, suggest the meeting before March 16. Okay. Mm. I'll tackle the things yeah. next. Mm. <coughs> So, that one, there was um, a legal matter involved. I'm not too sure whether that's why there's a hold up, but you're right, the, the last update uh, is some seven months prior. There needs to be an update on where it's at now. And if there is a legal issue that's holding it up, well, we can say that we're not revealing the details or the specifics. But that's another one that does need an update. Just another 14. Scott, there, um, there was a report for Doom Street, Hunter Street, and St John's ambulance sites. Well, I know some of that's completed, but I just wondered what happened to St John's. I spoke to you a few months ago. Scott, I just wondered what happened about that through the next. I don't have any update off the report, but I can find out. If you don't <clears throat> and through you, Mr. Mayor, Scott, um, the building our region is around two funding announcements I expect at the end of this month, which is getting close. So we've got those two applications in the airport runway enrichment program and the Black Gully Sewage plan upgraded. Are we getting a bit of an inkling as to when we might hear something about those projects? or? Still well, on track for this month? Yeah, through the chair. There were some comments made at the reason LGO queuing could be a little bit earlier than mm -hmm. expected. But, um, so any day? That could be rhetoric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. It was part of Deputy Premier's uh, <coughs> presentation, so she went through quite a few of the funding packages, highlighting the fact that they're obviously significant and important and you know, that they would be announced sooner or later. So, yeah. They announced that they would be honouring their um, NDRRA uh, back payments for the 2013-14 year um, that the, the federal government had sort of, I suppose, put on hold. So the state is going to honour their 25 percent commitment. I think it's 75, 25 percent of the federal to state, and they're going to back pay that now as a commitment. And they certainly were asking all of us to support them in lobbying the federal government to to hurry up with the balance, which is quite significant. There's 11. Just over eleven million dollars, so there'll be two million dollars coming back from the state, and obviously we may be the beneficiary of some of that money. Um, as um, so, it was uh, slightly political, but certainly um, it was probably pleasing that they were in fact quite topical. And any money is good money at the moment, and uh, obviously they're asking the federal the federal government to, um, I guess, hurry up um, uh, with their contribution for all. So. Any other meeting actions there? Yeah, through uh, yeah. you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mayor. Yeah. Item 74, page 7, in High School. Just an update when we can over the next few weeks. Uh, that one is as well. Um, yeah, I have spoke, I guess, this, and this is certainly uh, not a significant contribution to the, to the comments in here. I spoke to the principal there, they actually applied for those funding. He was going to check that for us and just see what it was up to. So we, we just, I guess I assured him on behalf of the council that we are certainly happy to proceed with it and he's ready to. And uh, Lock and Miller obviously has raised that again uh, with the department. So. When it goes forward, coming out of the recent AGL uh, Q conference, working in with states, you know, with the LGAQs heavily uh, supporting. Um, councils working with state government on these facilities. Is there somewhere where we can work together on this and, and go further forward yeah. to better the community? Through the chair, um, at that meeting at the end of the state of high school, we did talk about the contingency should their funding application be unsuccessful, then the council would look to financially support the works to the value of 130,000. But it wouldn't be as simple as uh, here's, here's the money would be um, a challenge for the member for Gregory to work with council and he did give an undertaking that he'd be prepared to do that to see if we could use that money to leverage support from the current Queensland government. So that's our, I guess, plan B. Um, we've been holding back, waiting for the outcome of the Greens 
the, the grant money is not successful, that's what we need to launch into is innovative ways to turn that 130,000 into more so that we can get a better result for the high school. Thank you. There was actually some discussion in one of the plenary sessions I attended the LDOQ around uh, schools or education facilities that have been subsequently uh, overtaken by, I guess you'd say, residential development and joining uh, safe within the, in the subsequent safety issues. So there is actually, I think, there may be a, a more identified uh, funding package that might come with, with uh, improving that situation. You know, I just think if we're going to be putting in some contribution towards that car park. You know, they've got a terrific undercover area there that we could utilise in many ways for the greater community, just not the education. And uh, I think we can leverage, if things go against us, it's plan A, but when we go to plan B, we've got some leverage there. So through the chair, that represents a slight departure from what we spoke about at the meeting, um, but if that's the case, then council would, council would be interested in looking at uh, possibly owning the land and then leasing back to the, the school. Is that a, so a, an option to explore? I don't want to go to get some meeting, but I think there could be something there. Yeah, but yeah, well, there's a community, the, the building the community to utilise the area. Okay. Especially if the LGA, LGAQ get, make some ground on, on that the use of uh, schools or state schools uh, to be leaning more towards community participation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's certainly something we can explore again through the chair. Um, I think the, the risk of their strategy for council was to be proactive and support the school with its endeavours through um, putting forward some seed money to get a good outcome and not get involved with acquiring more assets or being responsible for um, looking after more assets. But uh, hearing what you're saying, Councillor McIndoe, and if that's uh, something to explore, we'll certainly have a look at it. So before we act on, I think we're all taking away from this, if the if Council's happy to heed what Councillor McIndoe is suggesting, um, we won't launch into Plan B until we've had a discussion about different types of uh, arrangements or partnership arrangements with the state. Is that what I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got it there for BR1. When, when we're we likely to hear back from the department, from the, from the principal? The principal uh, would, is, will advise us as to whether or not that um, grant application is successful as soon as he knows. And then that would be, if it's successful, it's great news. If not, well, that was when we were going to try and leverage financial support from the state government through and we could do a lot more. Thank you, Mr. Councillors. Uh, we've been pursuing a uh, advice through the, the uh, Department of Transport and Roads, through the principal and also through local member, local members office to find out where they are for this funding. So we just haven't got any answer yet. Um, but yes, the CEO is correct. If the funding is unsuccessful, part of Plan A will execute, and obviously that funding contribution to us, that's in Bureau 1, would be to progress the, the, the works being as proposed along the school stroke. Uh, Plan B will then also have to kick into action at the same time. But yeah, unfortunately we haven't had any official advice. Thanks, so before we move off on that, Mr. Mayor, I probably need some clarity on uh, do we operate as we planned and uh, bearing in mind you went at the meeting, but do we operate as we agreed at the meeting or do we at least go back with a, uh, a shared clean paper and have a look at some different approaches? Just, I need, what, what would you like to do? Happy to go all the way and just looking for a bit of direction. I, I know the principle is really entertains the thought of utilising that undercover area as a more of a multi-stage complex for other sporting bodies throughout the community. Uh, as I said at the recent LGAQ meeting, there was a lot of talk about bringing those facilities uh, on, online for the greater community as well. And this could be a test case, maybe, potentially, um, to, leverage some of the, to leverage some of that happening. 
Um, it's, it's just a thought, that's all. Mm. At the risk of uh, decision making on the run, I think my preference would be just to see how how the application goes. And if that's successful, well, then that's great. But maybe throw Councillor McIndoe's suggestion in the mix as part of plan B, if, if and when required. But I'd just rather see how we go with the application and then revisit the plan B, maybe. So certainly from a lobbying point of view, I'd like to keep it simple for the time mm. being. Uh, I think there's some, a lot of goodwill there, and I think I'd, I think once that's achieved, and, and hopefully it will be, <coughs> you can always come back and revisit what they're saying. Uh, Councillor McEnroe will come back because I know there's still that goodwill there too. But I mean, during some of the flooding, I mean, the, the uh, kitchen at the high school is also uh, a relevant uh, evacuation point uh, as well. So, I mean, there's some things and some partnerships we can work out later on. So. Sure. Yeah. All right, councillors, any, any more? Right, well, we want to move on. Um, material personal interest, conflict of interest, personal gifts and benefits. No? There's no petitions in order, Mr. C. No, 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 thank you. Uh, committee recommendations. Now, we'll go through the uh, First part of those is uh, adopting those sort of minutes for the Finance and Infrastructure Standing Committee meeting. Uh, starting on page 29. Someone happy to move those? Move by Councillor Lacey, Seaman, Phil Smith. We'll do this together, we'll just do it. We'll, we'll run through those. We're happy with those. All in favor? Yes. Thank you. Okay, Council, the second part of those is the leadership and government standing committee meeting uh, minutes. That starts on page 41. Someone happy to move those? Moved by Councillor McIndoe. Second is Councillor Lacey. All in favor? Yes. Thank you. Straightforward, anything those? So, need to be brought up, Marnie, with the parents or not? Sorry? With the um, two copies of the. Um, which one was it? Was the so, they've been adjusted. So <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. The, the new uh, the agenda page is on page 40, and the rest of minutes are on page 41. Can I just ask um, a question in regards to the finance and infrastructure standing committee? Yes. The agenda item about the Emerald Airport uh, hangar and office building. Um, has that all progressed further? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councillor Bell, uh, we're awaiting uh, approval through budget review one for additional funds in regards to, um, to fund those improvement work to set up the funds. There's no allocated budget at this point, so we need to wait for budget review one for that approval. And all the other legal arrangements in regards to transfer of ownership, it's gone successfully? Uh, yes, I'm not aware of any uh, further um, claims from the um, the organisation that held some security over the hangar. Uh, we have sought independent valuation of those buildings um, from a perspective of bringing the assets onto Council's asset register in regards to their valuation as well as market valuations for rent with improvements and without improvements. And, and can I thank uh, Michelle very much for that uh, tour out there. It was uh, excellent. The opportunity to see the facilities at the airport and uh, obviously uh, uh, to get around and, and get a you know, very good feel of just where things lay at there, so, apart from obviously the um, terminal. All right, councillors, um, we'll move on to the report section of our agenda there, our first section of infrastructure and utilities, to the change of road name from Wilson Street to Hoy Road in Bogan Tongue. Uh, coincidentally, we were just there last week or the week before. Uh, Gerard, you look introduced to you? Yes. Uh, to the Mayor Councillors, <coughs> um, 
we've received this request from a member of the Hoi family um, requesting this the consideration of the change from Wilson <coughs> to Hoi Road and I'm going to let uh, Steve talk through the process we follow to make sure that uh, there was support for this uh, proposed change. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We sent out uh, 31 written requests for a comment. Uh, we've got six back. The, uh, the details of what we asked basically covered the idea of the historical link to the road, and, uh, to, to the pioneer families, and the possible consequences of the change and the inconvenience of the change in name and addresses, that sort of thing, to prompt the comment. Uh, five came back and said they're in favour of the change, primarily because of the link to the whole family. One was against because of the inconvenience of changing. Although, as I make clear in the report, that particular property is not on Wilson Road. And I think the, the, the intent of the, uh, the response was to say we should, the council should stay pretty steady with road names. Um, when you go through and evaluate the actual application, the boys are a pioneer family. We, we can make the, uh, the changes that are needed for the emergency services. Uh, there's no other Hoy Street, Hoy Road in the region. So it ticks all the boxes. Um, when we look down at the options, really it's a matter of do you want to make a change or not? It's quite straightforward, I think, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Steve. Well, look, can I just add a couple of comments here? I mean, we obviously had the opportunity of being at Bogan Tongue the other day, and, and uh, whilst it may not have been raised specifically, I mean, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, as a uh, the Gazette Township, Bogan Tongue is, is a significantly older uh, town. Uh, those street names would have been, I guess, uh, uh, chosen at that particular point of time with a, probably a very small history involved. Um, I think in the subsequent 100 years or 120 years, uh, obviously there's uh, some families there that have endured that, that whole period of time. The policy statement there that uh, we have uh, on road naming clearly indicates uh, the, the uh, is the criteria that we can use in, in deciding to change that. And um, notwithstanding that there may or may not be um, some people uh, uh, certainly uh, hoping to retain the old name, that wasn't the case. It was more about the inconvenience of uh, an address change, which is um, obviously a, uh, an issue for them. But I mean, at the end of the day, um, uh, it was very clear to us, I think, out there, that they do take the history of their township, their small township, very seriously. And it's a, it's, a, it's a really, really good opportunity to, I suppose, in some way, shape or form, recognise um, uh, a family that has been there almost for that duration. So um, that, that's, uh, that was my reading of it. Um, Councillor Sir, other comments? Councillor yes. Nixon. Moved by Councillor Nixon, seconded by Councillor Lacey. Uh, any other discussion or comments? All in favour? Against? Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. You're a very <laughs> slick kind of salesman. You are. And that doesn't happen very often, I'm sure. Okay, councillors, we move to page 65 of the agenda there in the, the community section, uh, which is an application number five uh, under the Economic Development Centre Framework uh, from Southwest and Wireless Communications Company. Um, Bradley, will you yeah, yes. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, councillors. Um, as the Mayor alluded to, this is application number five under our Economic Development Incentive Framework. Uh, these applications were, are considered on a case-by-case -case basis as a stimulus for economic development in the region. This application is for the reimbursement, reimbursement of material change of use fees regarding the installation and operation of mobile communication towers Within, within Emerald by Southwest Southwestern Wireless Communications Company. Uh, Mayor and Councillors, I have recommended a reimbursement of the fees that they have paid for the material change of use and also contents of the report there on page, um, I think it's 86 or 66, uh, actually shows the, uh, the five active sites that Southwestern have actually installed now at the moment. Um, 
So, Mayor and Councillors, this is our um, this is number five in the applications under the uh, incentive framework. The framework has been in place for two years now and is up for review. So, a report will be coming to Council with, with probably the new year to revise that. So, I'll just be recommending the um, the reimbursement of these MCU fees, Mayor. Thank you very much, Brad. Councillors, no, you. No, Councilor I just Council. thought there might be a little bit more explanation for the new councillors, but I think this is the first one we've had since the election. Well, of the actual policy, the yes. framework? Well, Brad, do you have a full? It's just about that. We have a group that's <coughs> about it. Uh, what, happened, what happened was, uh, the, thank you for that, Councillor. Um, previous, the previous Council um, had determined that uh, the Council needed to be active in trying to encourage either existing or retaining business or looking at expansion of the business in, in the business sector. And um, over the course of a number of months, and the policy came into place about two years ago, it allowed, uh, there was a group that was established called the Enterprise Central Islands Group that used to assess these applications. These applications were called uh, via print media, via the internet, website, etc. cetera. Uh, any companies could apply, both, uh, in both existing businesses or proposed businesses in the Shire. And from there, uh, the Central, the Enterprise Committee would assess the applications and recommended the council. There was no, it was purely a case by case basis. There was no monetary figure determined whether it was $1,000 or $10,000. It was purely on a case by case basis. Generally, the applications are received for usually MCU changes or some type of relief from building or plumbing fees as well. So, this is the fifth of the application we've done. We did one to assess or assist the uh, Maraboon Pet Resort as well. That was one in place. Uh, we've done one for uh, vet, uh, vet, veterinary surgery down in Ralston. And again, a lot of those are based purely on uh, usually the reimbursement of planning type fees. So again, it's just an incentive to try and encourage people to develop further either their existing business or attract a new business to the area. Small and, and of course, small farms, farms, yeah, small farms. So, councillors, uh, thank you, councillor Nixon. I mean, you're aware of the fact that uh, that was an exciting and very, very smart addition of the previous council to, to attract uh, these sorts of um, businesses to come and provide uh, innovation and, and different things that they provide. And obviously, it's worked well. Uh, and, um, Councillor Bell, you've had a bit to do with South West Communications. I mean, um, you might speak a little bit about what they do. Yeah, so, um, I mean, South West, they're an innovative um, regional corporation that's come to town to um, start the rollout of uh, you know, an opportunity for people to access um, broadband um, network through their system. Um, it's interesting to note that we've spoke this morning in the news meeting about the cost of uh, some of the new towers, the Black Band, the, the, broad, the Black Cross funding towers that are being continually pursued by us and many members of our communities are being around a million to $1.2 million per tower. Um, whereas these, this, this innovative group can uh, work, I suppose, in a slightly higher density uh, and their coverage is around 30 kilometres around radius. But, um, uh, but their tower systems are about $125,000 and that, that certainly has a, a you know, pretty good coverage um, in, in regards to distance, but it's also cost-wise, it's a, it's a heck of a lot cheaper um, to, to roll out. They, they do need to um, access back to some fibre and backbone fibre back to, um, uh, to, to, to make their system work. And, of course, the advantages of us being on that uh, Mount Isa to Brisbane fibre network, which runs down to Blackwater, through down to uh, Ralston and further south, um, has allowed us to, I think, partner with this group very, very nicely. They are a new innovative group. Um, they are establishing, they have established people in the town. Uh, they've um, got a, a created a number of new jobs and, you know, have uh, at this stage picked Emerald as their headquarters. So, all of that make, you know, makes a lot of sense for us to be able to support them in an innovative way because they are 
as I said, um, you know, um, a, a small and medium business, but really, uh, really focused on on the regions of, uh, of Queensland and New South Wales, and uh, and fit nicely the model that we've been looking for in, in regards to uh, to roll out of broadband um, and access to Wi-Fi for our rural and regional people, particularly in small small and medium businesses as well. So um, this is just a way we really we can get that uh, high speed broadband to um, our farming networks um, north to south. So uh, get the very worthy applicants and support the recommendation of um, Mr. Duke. Well, I think um, the other thing is, I mean, anecdotally, I think it's uh, made it a great deal of competition amongst other mm -hmm. providers, uh, which is uh, also a benefit to everyone. So any other comments or? I'd like to move that resolution. Moved by Councillor Lacey, second by Councillor Wimwood Home. All in favour? Against? Thank you, Councillors. Uh, page 87 of your agenda is the corporate services section, strategic asset management update. Very timely again, it seems to be the buzzwords moment, Margaret. Obviously, uh, Councillors uh, uh, would be aware that not only uh, just here, and certainly where it's in Portland at home, but uh, uh, at LGAQ conference, obviously, it's uh, probably the most significant item that uh, councils and council laws are discussing, and the implications. And obviously, Treasury Corporation are certainly uh, watching it with a great deal of interest. So, um, Jason, would you like to? Think? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. Councillors, this report is our first opportunity to report back really in relation to the asset management plans that were adopted in June uh, 2016. I think it's also timely to reflect on the Queensland Audit Office report number two released about two weeks ago, which talks about forecasting long-term sustainability of local government. One of the key recommendations there that relates to local government is really about maintaining complete and accurate asset condition data and asset management plans, and they form really the fundamental activities that we've been focusing on in this first quarter of implementing the plan that Council signed off on. Um, it's also been timely for us, I suppose, to understand how much effort that requires for our organisation and whilst we're making progress, maybe somewhat slowly on some of those initiatives, a lot of the energy in looking at the data, um, its integrity and our ability to really analyse and understand it um, has been the focus this time round and I think it's putting us in good stead for them giving quality information back to the council in terms of understanding our assets and how they will be replaced into the future. It's also about reflecting, I suppose, through um, you might notice in those terms of reference, we forecast uh, 12 months initially and beyond that, how we might continue to develop asset management uh, inside of council in a practical way, but also for you to see those outcomes reflected in our connections back to the long-term financial forecasts that we make through to the Treasury Corporation, but also in our long-term financial planning and forward budgets, and that's a space where we continue to um, look to improve the organisation. The report does um, track the progress of those individual initiatives in that first table there, and that's been traffic lighted, I suppose, to give you an indication that uh, we're relatively on track for some of those things, and there's probably only um, one area that we're behind at this point in time, but I believe you know, that's something that we can continue to pursue. Uh, part of this report does focus on the valuations and the project that was really allowing us to finish our year end accounts around the changes in methodology for valuations and also the flow and impacts of depreciation associated with that. Now that's been reported to Council's Audit Committee and I suppose at notice we're still waiting on final sign off by the Queensland Audit Office on our financial accounts for the year end of June 16. Um, but we're hopeful that everything um, progresses and there's been no concerns held by councils um, internal and external orders um, on that basis. There are some other initiatives that the program that the there are other initiatives that the report talks about, particularly in our asset data capture, and I'll ask the manager to speak to those um, in a level of detail and you'll find that attached report there showing you with some uh, maps and overlays about where the assets are and some better understanding and, and spatial recognition of what we do have 
and how we captured that, not only to better represent the data to council, but also in terms of us upskilling some of our staff in terms of utilising technology to get the outcomes that we need to get uh, to have the information available um, for decision making. And I suppose there's a snippet on the back of that report that talks about where we're heading with our um, uh, GIS or geographic information systems and its strategic development and how we see that close nexus between mapping um, a lot of the asset data and information so that we can represent not only you now in um, financial form but also spatially about where the information sits and lies. I might ask um, the manager Margaret to make some comments around some of those key initiatives today and then we're happy to take questions off of the councillors. Thank you Joseph. Uh, through the Mayor and councillors. I'll just provide a little bit more detail of um, what we focused on in the first quarter um, since uh, Council resolved to adopt the asset management strategy in Cabinet. We've implemented some uh, what we hope to be some robust governance arrangements by having an asset management steering committee um, and also an asset management champion group. I have mentioned the champion group before, but we had not really placed a lot of momentum on that until we had the strategy and roadmap endorsed. Uh, the Asset Management Steering Committee have met probably about three or four times and, um, and the Asset Management Champion Group had, uh, I, I would say, their inaugural meeting uh, with terms of reference and uh, probably about a three or four hour workshop on actually what would be their focus. Uh, and that's based around criticality, urgency and risk for some of those items within the roadmap. So just sort of focus on that in terms of we put some robustness and rigour around progressing things. As Jason said, uh, we've also spent a lot of time between uh, when the strategy was endorsed and now on looking at our methodologies around how we um, value our road network in particular, and also looking at the level of data that uh, we can collect, the level of data that we do collect, and then what we actually do with it. Uh, I've had an actual external um, bit of advice on having a look at our data and uh, the um, person actually said the amount of data we've got here is akin to drinking water from a water hydrant. Uh, so it's actually about making sure that we ensure that the data is meaningful and that it uh, tells us the information that we need to be able to make decisions from. And that actually takes a lot of effort. So while it may seem that there's a lot of yellow traffic lights there and not more green, that's what actually takes a level of effort to actually mine through that data and deep dive it. Um, we've also, um, sorry, in terms of the Parks Asset Data Collection Project, we took a collaborative effort with Parks and Gardens and um, looked at focusing and upskilling our field staff. So the first uh, project was on the Capella Park to actually look at how we could collect data with uh, in-field technology. The lessons we learned from that was that we used a particular piece of in-field technology called an arc pad trimble, and it was a bit clunky and a bit heavy, and we had some issues with data accuracy when we brought it back into uh, the office to upload into our asset management system. <coughs> so we took a lessons learned approach from that, um, with advice from the infield staff saying what would actually work better for them and also with our GIS staff being, being able to upload the data more efficiently and effectively. So we then moved out to seven other parks within the region, that being uh, Bohemia Blackwater, Emerald Springshaw and Thierry. And we've collected a lot of information on our recreational facilities, playground equipment, etc. And that is the basis for us to be able to inform some risk assessments around those particular areas, which obviously is critical for us with our communities using those facilities on a regular basis. <coughs> that was quite successful again. Uh, we had, it was quite efficient when we were able to bring the information back in inside the organisation and upload it into our systems. And as you'll see in the detail of the um, report, um, we've actually got them colour coded, condition one to um, five, uh, one being a nice green and red being a five. And uh, that will actually inform what we actually do in those areas in terms of conditions and improvements to those facilities. As Jason also mentioned, we have actually have a draft GIS strategy, and that strategy has been drafted as a result of uh, detailed internal workshops with our stakeholders and also a whole of council um, survey 
on what people actually felt we needed to get out of our GIS into the future. And that GIS strategy will be coming to council in the, in the near future uh, via a workshop so that we will be able to inform our future direction and investment into GIS. Take any questions from the council? Good. Just some of the, um, the abbreviations your uh, uh, NANS plus three, uh, LTFP, uh, it's on, the, on page uh, 87. What is the, the based on a capital NAMS plus three, what's that system? That's the National Asset Maturity System. And that is um, the, inf the infrastructure, International Infrastructure Management Manual is often referred to as the Black Book that was uh, created by uh, the public sector of New Zealand. To actually put some level of uh, layman's terms around that, they created this maturity system and that's what the NAMS is. Our roadmap or the principles in our roadmap are based on that. So around uh, those th key things like accountability and direction, asset information management, asset life cycle management, and also service level management. And the LTFP? Long-term financial plan. Okay. AM systems? Asset management system. Uh, AMP? Asset management plan. Because <laughs> I'll ensure that I um, have, a, have a, an abbreviation or a um, glossary of terms at the back of any report. Uh, through the chair, just a question in regards, we've gone out with parks and gardens and we've come up with 14 new assets on our asset register. Are they actually our assets? Or are they actually individual clubs, assets that have gone onto our land without it snowing? Does that make us all, does that make them our assets? The 101 extra assets, yep, that we've um, brought on uh, contain a range of, of assets that aren't, in theory, ours. So they're captured within our system, not from a financial perspective, uh, but as a recognition that there is a particular asset on some no, example. Not concern, no. They're not going on our financial asset no. register. No. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Well, Council, I suppose there's a, there's a follow on, <coughs> on the uh, bigger discussion about our asset management plan. Obviously, there's a, several issues contained within this. And obviously, these are practicalities about actually just collecting that information, making it relevant. Um, so, obviously, um, these are good programs for tools and, and give you an idea how you know, those uh, innovation sort of tools we're using, you know, certainly in the GM, GIS and, and the iPads are certainly making that um, the field ops will work, uh, I guess you'd say, easier. So that's uh, an interesting insight into how that works. Um, I suppose what is uh, a question I was going to ask you, maybe 2.37, and is that what has a an average of our assets, is that an appropriate on page 120, which is probably the data collected on those sites that you actually went to. Um, you have a condition average by facility, and I suppose overall uh, it was about 2.37, is that? Yeah. I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, what, what page is that? I'm sorry, page 120, which is almost... Oh, sorry, nine. Page nine, nine. Nine of yours. I don't know. Is that graph Page 9 of the park assets collection, phase 2. Just, just the graph market with those, you know, the uh, barcode graph. Keep going. Keep going. No, no, that's fine. Well, I just thought it was just a general comment about it. Having, having found it all market, I mean, is that, um, I suppose, depending on the, the facilities there, that's about right, 2.37? Yes, it is. Part of that actually contains a level of subjectiveness. Yeah, yeah. So within our, without me going into all of that uh, language, within our business process models, which is essentially the decision making and also contains our condition assessment methodology, when we go out and do a condition assessment of any one of the assets, has uh, criteria within it that is based on um, a standard. It isn't 
necessarily fit for purpose for Central Highlands Regional Council. It's a standard. So, but there's a level of subjectivity. So with the, a, a person, so you may go out and look at a, a, a recreational asset with this guide and say, well, I actually give that a three. And I might come along and say, well, actually, I give that a four. So there is a level of subjectivity in there. And as we move forward in getting more confidence with the way how we collect the data and trying to lessen that sub subjectivity, I'd be able to hand on heart, say, absolutely, it's a 2.37. I'm very confident of that. And then we also rely on our valuation uh, process. So when we have our valuers come out and conduct a comprehensive valuation, they also look at it with a level of uh, another level of objectivity from a service potential index and financial valuation. So it's about trying to marry up the detailed condition assessment also with the financial valuation to give us a true view. So when, when we do these field inspections, are, that, are we going to designate staff doing that or is it all, you know, certainly doing these on, on the building in particular? So for this, for this particular one, um, Mr Mayor, we uh, used Capella and some field staff who were located at the Capella um, office. And then based on that, we upskilled further staff here within the Emerald area and also these other areas to go out and do it parks and garden stuff. And the thing is too, Mayor, it's, a, it's our goal to make sure we get as many people as possible trained in that level of expertise. Um, because to have more people trained in that, <clears throat> you know, in that evaluation uh, of assets and providing that data in the in the corporate system will better help the organisation. Thank you. Other questions, councillors? No, so is it is the, the alignment between our um, our whole life costings and I suppose you know what we see as the. Uh, True value of most of our assets is it is it now um, uh, both being accepted by the state? Are we still seeing some, um, I suppose, some, some differences of theory, theoretical processes, or actual processes in which way in which we value our assets between us and the state recommendation roads, for instance? What do you do about the base, or what do you do with the formation? What do you do with the, you know, whatever seal, or what do you do with the, the reserve? Is, is all of that sort of now come together in any way, shape, or form? Uh, thank you, Councillor Bell. In the last, uh, for the uh, valuations ending 2015 16, we conducted a very extensive internal review um, to look at our, in particular, road uh, valuation. So we looked at our unit rates, we looked at our lives and did a whole lot of benchmarking and sought external advice as well on that. So I suppose the long answer to that, it's still a piece of work under review. Um, that internal review that we did um, certainly highlighted uh, that we've got um, our roads are at a, probably a very high condition, uh, potentially a better condition than what is perceived, and that therefore means we have potentially more depreciation, which is an affordability issue. So it is a piece of work that continues to be a focus for uh, myself and for um, the manager of finance and also infrastructure and utilities to actually ensure we come up with a more balanced outcome. Mm -hmm. I might add to that, Mr. Mayor, yeah. if I can. Um, Councillor Bell, we've you know, gone to great lengths to engage with the Queensland Audit Office around getting some standardisation around the methodology. Um, from my perspective, this is the same argument we had 20 years ago around the condition-based depreciation, evaluation methodologies, and, and again, the types of or the methods of depreciation that we use. So the first set of financial statements that I inherited from the last financial year raised some concerns around that valuation methodology and use of the condition basis. So we essentially adopted what the PYO have asked us to do in terms of moving to a straight line depreciation approach, but we've also adopted, I suppose, their componentization of valuations as well to better understand what condition our assets are in and how we might value them much more simplistically than we have in the past. So today, and following discussion through our audit committee, we're satisfied that we're in a good position ourselves. We, haven't been told by the state agencies either that 
the Department or the Queensland Order Office that we're going in the wrong direction. So we're continuing to push the line that we're taking at the moment. And I suppose the advice we're getting externally um, through QTC and, and I suppose other experts are that we are on the right track and that we are, I suppose, towards um, the, um, the leading type councils in terms of pushing to streamline and consolidate the efforts over the last you know, number of years that we've worked on this. But um, as Margaret has said, we are um, continuing to work on that inside the organisation so that we get a better uh, acceptance right across the organisation and you get the responses from your accountants and engineers that actually marry up uh, rather than contradict. So that's still a piece of work that we're working towards. Yeah, working through the chair, um, trying to see it from the a councillor's perspective that's been associated with the organisation for a while. It is a bit perplexing because our assets have gone from about 800 million to 1.6 billion in the course of being a young organisation, only eight years old, and it's hard to understand how it can grow like that when you look at what we've been creating since then. There's been a lot of changes and improvements, but not to that extent. A lot of it is to do with best methodologies and more accurate data, um, depreciation is the other lever, and how we treat that. Obviously, if the, the asset value is higher, the depreciation is going to be higher. And we've also talked about how we need to use the um, obsolescence in our policies to try and identify what it is that would replace and not replace it all to take some pressure off that depreciation <coughs> equation. But it would be good to certainly have a look at how each of those asset classes have changed over our eight years to help form some longer term uh, judgment on, on how it's going. And um, yeah, so it's not really a comment or a question. It's I suppose it's just growing and growing and growing, and it, it creates a tremendous pressure on our on our uh, organisation. If it's all being done totally responsibly, well, then that's all fine. That's part of that, and that informs the the need for us to pull on that obsolescence lever a whole lot more. But there could be some opportunities. I know the former minister for local government was advocating for. Um, Certainly, uh, nothing new, but a different way of looking at asset accounting, and that suggested some opportunities to look at. I don't know whether we've got an opportunity to, to do that or not, but yeah, I think the whole thing needs a higher level of credit, I guess, uh, particularly for a councillor to satisfy themselves that it's all okay when you see how much that growth has occurred over eight years. Uh, and I certainly want to see it as well. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Well, I think councillors, as I said, this is a this is a journey we're going on here, mm -hmm. and um, notwithstanding whether we like the figures or we don't, the, the reality is we are in this process of about getting to to more meaningful numbers. I guess at the end of the day, and that's got to match up with our financial statements. Um, you know, John Seen talked about you know straight line uh, depreciation methodologies, and, and that works for some things. <coughs> Uh, obviously, the fact that we're in a region where there's been a lot of NEWRA works, uh, that raises some problematic issues, I guess, in terms of the fact that uh, arguably lots of our road links have been renewed to a very high standard, and so subsequent depreciation implications of, um, you know, and, and in, 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 in balancing that against, obviously, the council is in a sound position and looking to perhaps um, you know, be ambitious about some of the things they do, that's got to be balanced up against that obligation of depreciation. So. Um, you know, it, it's it's a lot more data to collect, and um, obviously it takes some time. So I very appreciate very much what you're doing. Um, Jason, councillors, any other particular comments there? There's just uh, there was one one uh, paragraph there mentioning staff turnovers while the process of is that being fixed or doing smarter with ideas or fix it. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we're working with the resources that we've got at the moment um, to effectively try and um, still achieve what we're planning to do. Um, we're also reviewing the way in which we go about that work as well to see that we um, you know, get the best value for money. We've had an offer come in from an external agency to um, learn from a councillor in Victoria that appears to be um, in the leading practice position. So we're having a look at that as well before we uh, essentially look at what the resourcing requirements might be. 
So um, we're not necessarily using it um, as a basis for things slowing down, but just making sure that we're on the right track. Um, and we, I suppose, are setting, we're setting ourselves up to a sustainable position so that the organisation can continue to build on what we have. Comments, councillors? That was a report for noting, I think, uh, Jason. Yes, Mr. For noting, no, no resolution. Yeah, there's no written resolution. As I said, Martin, thank you very much for your diligence there. It's um, a timely uh, update from um, that great uh, report you brought early on this year, which was certainly landmark in this council in getting to the, the level that they have with their uh, asset management. So thank you, Margaret. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Council, it's page 133 of um, your old fashioned agendas. Um, for those in the technical space here, um, you're on your own. Uh, monthly financial report um, for September. Um, through you, Joseph, if you want to introduce you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council, the report for uh, the month of September 2016 uh, is before you. I'll just touch some highlights and then between the manager of finance and I will continue to interpret what's in there for you. Um, Hopefully you're finding, again, more information and the report being developed um, further in terms of additional graphs and that um, of assistance to you. Um, I've already mentioned that we're waiting for the final sign-off from the Queensland Audit Office of our you know, 2016 year accounts. Um, we're hopeful that that might come you know, uh, in the next week or so uh, to give us some finality in terms of any other reporting obligations around the annual report. Uh, you will note in this month's report that we've included information regarding the trust account balances uh, to give you some appreciation for the money that's held um, in trust. In terms of our management reporting, uh, the financial position remains on track and in line with budget at this point in time. Uh, we are making preparations for budget review one and analysing uh, the results that we've achieved today uh, in terms of the uh, actual expenditure of revenues coming in. Council makes its um, interest and redemption payments on its loans um, on each quarter, so September, December, March and June. So we have made a payment this financial year and you'll see that debt balance has essentially wound back about a million dollars uh, as a result of that particular change and no new borrowings um, occurring for the financial year. But we are starting to see in terms of our investment strategies um, the good rates that we achieved some months back are now you know, not as available as they have been and I know uh, rates that came for me to uh, make decisions on last week were more around the 2.8 to 2.9. You'll note there that we had 3.3 or thereabouts in there before and that's just a reflection of the change in the economy and the market um, at this point in time. But we're trying to have a look at you know, tempering the longevity of those investments as well on the basis of having some understanding about what might go on uh, with the interest rates moving forward. There is further analysis there in relation to um, the rate arrears and the work being done in relation to the rates and the last year we talked about that in some detail. For the capital expenditure projects and that's near the table on the bottom of page 139, whilst you might look at that budget percentage spent being 25% and that looks okay, if you have a look at the, um, the pictorial over the page where we're trying to you know, match that cash flow line that we've put in there based on there's a lot of work to occur in the first half of the year so it's been accelerated and then you'll still see that our bars are below those line, that line of expected cash flow so um, that's still something that we're trying to work on in terms of improving that. One of the projects ticking away there though through that top 10 capital expenditure projects is the Blackwater Aquatic Centre, so looking at the payment structure, we're spending about $2 million a month on that, and uh, my colleague, General Manager Communities, might um, confirm that for me as well, but it seems to be well on the way to uh, meeting its completion time. And again, on page 141, there's an analysis that shows, you know, uh, better than expected local supplier for the month of September just based on the work that we're currently doing and the supply that we're looking to attain. So Shelley, if you could make some comment please in relation to uh, particularly rates and some of the capex and then we're happy to field questions on the
Thanks, Councillor Jackson. Councillors, Mr Mayor. So the rates outstanding as of today are about 9.6 million. You'll see that that's dropped significantly since the date of this report, and that's just around the timing of, of that due date being just two days before this report. Of that 9.6 million, around about the 5.1, relates to the previous financial year. Um, and the remaining of 4.6 odd million relates to this current rate that was just due. So a lot of that we we will be getting in over the coming weeks, just as we send out reminder notices. Um, so first reminder notices and second reminder notices of the process we go through um, before we go forward with that um, and, and put a little bit more um, pressure around, I guess, around collecting collecting those rates. So we'll get a lot of that money coming through over the next month as we remind people that they've missed their rates due dates. Um, obviously, as council knows, we it's an, an area that we um, we need to focus on to try and keep those uh, work with the ratepayers to to pay those rates. And essentially, at the moment, we've got um, uh, around about a thousand assessments with our debt collection agency where. Um, they can enter into payment arrangements to pay all those, all those rates off at this point in time. We would not have sent any of those from the last rates run through um, to that. We basically are sending reminder letters at the moment, just waiting on um, seeing if we can get, if we can get more, more payment plans coming through from those um, rate payers. We are certainly taking a lot of payment plans. We're getting a lot of uh, queries and a lot of advice uh, requests for payment plans. Difficulties is trying are trying to balance um, taking any money that um, that ratepayers can afford to give and trying to find a, a payment plan that is sustainable that will actually pay off those rates in the long term. So, councillors, is there any questions on any other areas that you might be going into more detail? Just on the the capital works expenditure, and yeah. um, I think we should highlight the public that the percentage of um, representing 66% of the total annual budget being the spend to date. You know how we actually—it seems that we've ramped up the actual works in this last. Absolutely. Yes. So, so councillor, it is. It is normal for that, that trend to go up throughout the year. So once the budget is, is um, adopted, <coughs> then generally there's a process of going out to tender, getting things designed. And that, those first few months of any project is a, a slow um, dollar figure or payment period, generally speaking, and you do see that ramp up over the period in the end of the year. Uh, we are expecting that to ramp up over the next few months in terms of there were quite a number of projects that, um, quite a number of large projects that were scheduled to be finished around December, January, um, predominantly the pool and the NDRA works. So um, we are starting to see those projects really come through with a lot more spend on them. Probably key to note um, that those 10 projects uh, that are just there, just for your information, do represent 66% of our total budget. So it gives you a fairly good overview of where we're at on those 10 projects. Through the Chair, I might also, Jason might like to make a comment on it as well, because I know that from a, an overall perspective, even though that's ramping up, when you look at that cumulative graph, on page 140, um, we really need to be on that blue line. So if you look at July, you could say that that's roughly about $4 million. And then it's cumulative, so another probably four, four and a half or five might get you to $9 million for August. And then if you look, it's, it's hard to say precisely, but maybe another five might have you in $16 million. So while it's going up, it's probably not going up at the rate that it needs to. Jason might have a view on that. I know that he's been working with Gerard on, on the overall trajectory of his capex spend. We're early into the financial year, but if anything, we should be on or above that blue line now because we'll really taper off at Chrissy and then we've got to get back into it 
after starting to come back off from leaving, you'll see why the blue line does have that kink in it, is recognising that there will be a deceleration. Or it's still increasing, but at a, at a lesser rate. But Jason, did you want to Mr. Lightheart? Yeah, thanks, um, Mr. CEO. Um, I suppose what we're trying to highlight with that report and, and to underline what the CEO said then, the further we get behind with that, the harder it is for us to catch up. And Shelley was really trying to illustrate that um, there will be normally at the start of the year a, a planning phase um, before that work starts. But what we've also done in that budget was carry over a range of projects that were already up and running. Um, and that's why the trajectory of that line, you know, is accelerated or looks a bit steeper than it might further on. So those works that we said we were committing to, we're not spending as fast as we said we were going to spend at this point in time. And uh, my colleague, the general manager for infrastructure might have comments on that around individual projects. But at the end of the day, we've got catch up to play there so we can get to that blue line and probably we need to exceed that blue line between now and Christmas as projects come to fruition. Um, I made the commentary around the pool project simply because I can physically see the burn on that project being around the $2 million a month in the accounts for the payments that we make. Um, you can see that we are making progress around at least one of those MDRRA projects, but the costings on the other aren't necessarily at the level that they need to be. So we will be working much closer as we get towards you know, the new, the mid-year break uh, around Christmas to look at where those projects are at because we're going to need to play catch up through you know, the next um, three to five months if we want to be on track by the time we get to March 17 so that we can sit here in a budget deliberations for 17, 18 and actively understand what will get done out of the current capital years projects that we've listed and uh, there will be a report come into the strategy meeting for discussion hopefully next week regarding budget review one and the status of the capital works um, carried forwards and, and existing projects uh, that will need to address uh, not only that cash flow line and our ability to spend the money but what we're doing in terms of accelerating the delivery um, of that work. So um, thanks for that opportunity Mr CEO to add that clarity for the council. So, uh, can you also tell me with that, um, that reporting thing? Obviously, there's a bit, a bit more detail on so some of the graphics around that. The recommendation of the Central High Regional Council received a monthly financial report for the month of the 30th of September. Those in favour? Against? Thank you. Council, so if we go to page 147 of your agendas, uh, the Central Highlands Development Corporation, their service level agreement, October update, uh, Sandra Hobbs down the here. So thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as we do on, on a regular basis each month, I provide the uh, October update of our service level agreement of reporting responsibilities for the service level, service level agreement deliverable outcomes. <clears throat> so the business development support. So this month there's been 41 specific visits to those areas identified of Dysart, Genfield, Springshaw, Capella, Thierry, Blackwater, Bluff, with 15 days on the road visiting those the businesses in those areas. Uh, we have, um, although there are ongoing registrations happening on our business directory, there's been six new specific businesses with two, two startup businesses registered this month. Um, and one of the things now that we have the Agribusiness Development Coordinator on board at CHDC, there's, we're targeting an increase in the registration of rural businesses on our business directory. That's one of the areas that had not had a significant number of registrations in the past. So events, the Central Highlands Investing in Our Future Conference is starting tomorrow. So it's um, fairly full on at the moment. So we've got a total of 120 registrations with 96 specifically for the summit. 
Um, and there's still registrations coming in today. So that, that conference uh, is a combination of opportunities for people to see what's happening in this region and to have the opportunity to meet um, with other business people and other stakeholders and other um, advisors that can provide information and support to growing the business potential and sustainability into the future. And that includes four site tours with following workshops and forums, two networking events and the summit program on the Wednesday. Event planning for the future, we've now booked um, two of the business breakfasts for next year, which is a correction there, it's the 17th of March next year, 2017, and the 19th of May 2017, uh, which we'll be putting in your four calendars for the future. Um, and the other planning that's going on at the moment is next year we'll be once again doing the Central Highlands Business Excellence Awards for 2017. And so at this stage, we're starting the planning for the business skilling workshops that will be done in collaboration with CQ University and the local Bio Foundation. We'll run those workshops um, in the 10 months in the lead up to the final Gala event for Business Excellence Awards, and they will provide the opportunity for businesses and stakeholders and, and people in the region to develop core skills, um, which specifically are identified in the Bum Basin Business Development Initiative Strategy. So far, there's um, work with development planning and, and uh, bookings for 13 workshops. Um, and the first one of those will be in February, where we'll be doing uh, working with CQU to uh, deliver a three-day workshop for project planning. Um, and that, that will be available for anybody. We're actually running, um, in conjunction with the university, um, some non-accredited training so that they will provide people with um, some opportunities to develop those skills without having to go through the whole process of um, assessment criteria, but are able to develop those skills. And it also means that the um, cost of participating in those training events is much more affordable for many people. Grants and funding. <clears throat> so there's a list there for your information on the submissions that have been provided on behalf of council. Um, we have been successful in receiving $7,245 for the Emerald Town Hall IT and AD equipment. And just last week we received information that the, we've been successful in, in the funding application for the Dingo Mains Supply for Water Treatment Plan to the value of $430,000. $160,000. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> the um, additional applications under development include those in the Interim Infrastructure Pipeline Program, and they're listed there as well, which have been identified in the previous meeting. Regional development currently in the process of doing the development of scope of works for um, digital action and audit partnership with CHRC and also the economic master plan. So we're hoping to have those um, out for um, quote uh, by the end of November uh, so that they can, that the activity can start on those and the work being done in the early in the new year. Um, we're also we um, also this month had a meeting with with Luke Blankowski um, in relation to looking at how we actually deliver the project management for the Emerald Entertainment Event and Evacuation Centre. So um, the uh, plan, the approval for the change of title is in process for that. Um, but yeah, we're looking at how we we actually pull together a um, an advisory committee for that and and start the work on actually delivering moving forward on delivering the concepts on that and the, um, what the community would like to see within that facility. In addition to that, um, CQU are at the, currently um, working on the CQU Health Partnership Strategy and have today put out the terms of reference for the Central Highlands Health Hub. So that's another development that we're working with um, CQU University in relation to growing that potential around health services in the region. Tourism, we're now coming to the end of our tourism season, so you'll see a few less caravans on the road as you're travelling around. Um, uh, Peter Grigg, the Tourism Development Officer, had uh, worked with 24 operators throughout the month across the Central Highlands and has been um, connecting with the community reference groups in all of those areas identified um, in the report. One of the things that we're particularly working with the community reference groups on at the moment is the text and content that will be incorporated in the, in the new visitor guide that's been currently being developed. 
Um, so we've asked those community reference groups to provide that information about their communities um, and the experiences that, that, that people can enjoy in those communities. So the new visitor guide will be a 56 page guide and it will be um, it will be out next week. The prospectus will be out next week for advertising and um, that will be available for the start of the season next year. So we're actually delivering um, and developing our own visitor guide for this region this year. For the next two years, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so uh, visitor information standards. So currently, uh, they're up to they've distributed in excess of 10,000 visitor guides from the centres to travellers. The September sales figures have increased by 24% over the same time last year, and the visitor numbers have all also increased at approximately 30%. Um, caravan parks are indicating that they're currently um, up about 18% um, at this time than they were last year. And our uh, visitor information centre, so we'll be, we've had um, extended opening hours uh, during the um, peak time of the season, but that will be, will be reverting back to the uh, normalised hours from the end of October through until April. The Agriculture Precinct. <clears throat> so there's been the development of an advocacy document for the Yamala Special Industrial Area, the Central Highlands Meat Processing Plant. In conjunction with that, um, the Agribusiness Development Coordinator has developed an employment fact sheet, which I brought with me for the purposes of, of the um, councillors, which I'll leave here. Um, there's some more specific in information about the benefits of those um, projects and what they will bring to the economic and employment opportunities that they will bring to the region. Um, in addition to that, we've been um, invited to um, China by the Bank of China to attend a, a cross-border investment and trade conference. So in addition to the inland port and the special industrial area, we've also identified some other opportunities um, and investment opportunities that we're able to take over and promote over there as well. Uh, and it's a good opportunity to promote and profile the region and what's happening here. So there'll be over a thousand investors at that conference. Um, so that'll be an interesting experience. Um, <clears throat> so we're developing an investor prospectus uh, in conjunction with the, the ones that we've already identified, but also in, in conjunction with commercial operators so that we're able to take the maximum opportunity over there. So the Agribusiness Development Coordinator, Ms. Alexander, is now um, on board and has been with CHDC since the 3rd of October. And from here, she will be presenting to Council of the Strategy meeting on the 6th of December for, uh, to bring you up to date on the um, Agribusiness Strategic Plan and the Agribusiness Advisory Group that she's proposing to um, take agribusiness forward into the future for this region and grow the potential that the region has. One of those activities will be to progress the um, development of the local produce data collection, and that's being done in conjunction with growth from the CQ. Um, our closure for, um, for the for 2016, for Christmas closure, will be closing from the 23rd of December, reopening on the 3rd of January. Any questions? Who's going to China, Senator? Um, Liz and Liana and myself. Uh, through the chair, when we uh, head over there, you're looking at uh, food hubs and discussing that, or just the uh, intermodal hub and the, the, those no, precincts? No, we will be taking a, a, a range of um, commercial opportunities. So they've invited us over there to provide information and opportunities in relation to tourism and pasture. But that pretty much means anything. So um, we'll be, uh, we've been. Uh, they are hosting us, so um, uh, they deployed us and are covering the cost of the, of the trip over there. Um, our, but we'll be taking as much as we can to pro provide a range of what we're able to deliver here. When we when we went down to the uh, event in Sydney in May, one of the things we realised is they've got a very limited understanding of what is, is available in this region. They consider, when they look at it on the map, they think it's desert. So. Um, We'll be taking as much as we can to profile the benefits of, of, of the investing in this region. So, Councillor, just to double up on what the said earlier um, for tomorrow, the tours, obviously they kick off about nine or thereabouts. 
the councils have registered. So there's four tours, and obviously then there's subsequent forums that come up. That those are going to South Blackwater might we'll do that in Blackwater, and the others will be here. So tours two and three will actually join back here at uh, the uh, Calvary Church over in uh, South Emerald, and then obviously the Pioneer Village uh, tour is. Uh, at Capella is obviously uh, at uh, the point of village. And out yeah, to Lily Bar. So the tourism yeah. might be covering that area with some speakers. In that yeah. I think from memories, we had um, 14 going to the Fairburn Dam, um, 31 going to Yamala, 7 are going up to Capella, and the balance of, I think. 15 to the resources one in the water. Yeah. That's good. It's really good. <laughs> And then the, the reception, the welcome reception tomorrow night, we've got 81 people attending that at the Western Gateway. And then Sundowners, which is post-conference, um, which will be in, in Walton Park at the Easel, there's 62 attending that one. So and they both start at 4 p.m.? Yeah. yeah. And then obviously Wednesday is the, uh, the uh, actual conference summit day, and uh, there's some very, very interesting speakers there. So as uh, I saw one, um, Network circular going around that's probably arguably one of the strongest um, agricultural representations. And they don't want to be investing in their future conferences, so they are looking very much forward to that. I think that came from cotton growers and irrigators, so uh, they are certainly promoting around their networks. So we we'll certainly urge any councillors that are around tomorrow and then Wednesday to take the opportunity to be there. So thank you very much. Any other questions for Sandra? Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much, Sandra. Yeah. And uh, have you had your appropriate shops to travel over the time? Yes, I've got two sore arms. Well balanced. Well, don't be getting rabies and coming over the time. Well, that's, that's it is, it's very prevalent amongst dogs and um, squirrels. So. <coughs> um, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to talk about a change to the agenda. Council's happy. I would like to withdraw one of the items from the closed session agenda and bring it forward on the open board and discuss it now. It uh, doesn't technically need to be in closed session. It was reported out to me by uh, another councillor, and I think everyone's happy. That's, that's the first report, exception from obtaining quotes or tenders prior to entering contractual arrangements. Quite happy to do that one now before we go into general business if Council's happy. Did the councillors uh, draw uh, and deliver a report on that? Yeah. Yeah, going through, through the main councillors. Um, we both received in retrospect the endorsement by, uh, by yourselves uh, uh, for action undertaken to enter into a contract under section 235B of the local government regulation of uh, 2012. Uh, without first uh, inviting written quotes or tenders. Um, the background is essentially that we've uh, um, engaged AXA Group uh, to do some specialised and confidential stakeholder engagement on our NDAA contract um, arrangements. And uh, they have previous experience in a similar role, if you recollect, with the backwater water treatment plant and supply issues we've had. So essentially um, they were selected on the basis of that expertise. They were um, well they're not on local buy, so they're not on our uh, local panel, uh, local buy panel providers. Basically we're just seeking that exemption and we make specific reference to section 235 where it says the local government may resolve that because of specialised confidential nature of the services that are sought, it, could, it would be impractical, impractical or disadvantageous for the local government to invite quotes or tenders um, before entering in a contractual arrangement above 15 without inviting present quotes, etc. Yeah, Councillor, this is what I just asked to see you uh, back, back uh, to our yeah, certainly more than happy to add on to that and just say that at the time there was a need to be reactive. There were some issues that had to be addressed. And the other, I'll just clarify too that um, 
regarding the Blackwater water capital upgrade uh, and the issues associated with drinking water quality, uh, we've engaged a Greek Berg uh, in his own right in conjunction with a, Mr Stuart Doak who oversaw the um, CapEx delivery as well as uh, the communications. Uh, Greg was the communications uh, link on that project and it's through that form of knowledge and the rapport that he demonstrated with community members in being able to enter into genuine uh, discussions and his availability and work ethic. Uh, I saw sort of fit to pick up the phone and try and have uh, Greg uh, help out with this issue. <coughs> Since then he's part of a group, a bigger group, the VAXA group, and uh, Greg will be involved in this project. Initially we're working with Mr Mark Schaefer, but uh, those same exemplary qualities of good communication skills and professionalism that were evident in Greg are evident in Mark and it's proven to be the right decision and it's for those reasons that um, I've chosen to act uh, and it is necessary and right for this report to come before council and I have to see fit uh, to endorse my actions retrospectively in not going to the market for those prices. Okay. Uh, moved by uh, Councillor Nixon and then the uh, recommendation is if the Central Highlands Regional Council retrospectively endorse the action undertaken when you do a contract under Section 234B and I can go with regulation to that. So that's effectively without getting uh, written quotes first to attend as um, under the guidelines there, but obviously with the uh, with the, ex with the exempt exemptions that were allowed under, under the Act. Um, we can do that. So moved by Councillor Nixon, seconded by Councillor Gordon Smith. All in favour? Against? Thank you. Well, councillors, we do have um, some other business actually on the closed session. We won't do those right now. We'll actually do our general business if uh, we can do that. Um, and we'll go back to, uh, for the, in the interest of our visitors today so that they're not inconvenienced. Um, we'll actually go to our, our general business uh, section. So, councillors for general business. Uh, Councillor Nixon, you had something there about uh, your awards ceremony in the weekend? Yeah, yeah. I did. Um, I'd like to thank Council for giving me the opportunity to go down to Brisbane to the awards, the SES awards, uh, with Carl Phillips, um, our local SES controller out there, um, received the Queensland Award. Um, it's the first time that that award has ever been anywhere near this region. And I just think that I'd like to move a vote of thanks to Nicole for all the work she has done and ask that we send her um, a thank you letter from Council. And I just think it was um, really a tremendous thing to show back to the work that our emergency services do in this area because it's all tied together. And um, I think that you know, it's a real privilege to be there to see that award. So thank you very much for that opportunity and um, yeah. congratulations to Nicole. Thank you, Councillor Nixon. If I can, can I add uh, uh, my endorsement to that? Um, Nicole obviously, pre the previous weekend, had obviously received the uh, Central Queensland SES uh, member of the year uh, and obviously uh, then subsequently went to Brisbane uh, for that award uh, in the State Awards. She, she wins the Minister's Cup, which is, um, if you've seen the uh, Material that uh, Glenn Bell uh, circulated this morning uh, is quite a significant award. I mean, her personal impact on, on the, the SES group here and her contribution through uh, the flood, flood events here in the Central Highlands over uh, two events and, and her subsequent work in terms of uh, uh, recruiting uh, at Blackwater uh, and work at schools and um, other uh, community projects about um, uh, seeking um, some more. I suppose it's a recruitment around the SES uh, concept. It's been second to none. She's been very much involved with the uh, water rats uh, exercises at Fairburn Dam. Uh, she effectively lives and breathes um, you know, her commitment to the Central Highlands and to the SES. And obviously, as we all know, at uh, great personal expense of time and, 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 and probably money. But uh, I certainly endorse uh, Councillor Nixon's remarks. Um, she's an extraordinary individual uh, and she has a great team around her. So. Uh, I uh, will certainly pass on that vote of thanks. So, um, Councillors, it's been moved. We move a vote of thanks. So it's been moved by Councillor Nixon. I have a second. Second of Councillor Godwin Smith. All in favour? Against? Thank you. Any more general business? Sorry. Yep. Councillor Roll. 
Um, a couple of weekends ago, I attended a meeting out at the Rainworth Fort, um, and the the ladies um, that run the fort don't own the land, but um, they heritage listed the the actual fort, the concrete, the stone building, and um, as subsequent of that, they now doing a um, Conservation. conservation management plan and there was a, quite a bit of distress about what what this would entail but um, at the meeting they, the family and, and um, everybody had come to agreement to have that done just on, on the stone building um, and it was quite evident from a, a remark that Lorna Smith made that um, <coughs> they're not those two old ladies are not over yet. She just said that um, she said, you know, we closed the we closed the fort at the end of end of this month, so we've got nothing to do for three months. So yeah, she's very both in their mid eighties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're both in their mid eighties. So um, so it was a good outcome eventually because they were really they were very concerned that they <laughs> might be told to. To do something drastic about the buildings, etc. Well, I'm sure that will that come back to council as a bit of a report on. Uh, maybe run through that um, cultural what's funding. Yeah. 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 Some of the funding they actually acquired from Jubilus, yeah. and then there is some funding through Reddit. So there's a combination of funding there. So it will go back through that cultural activity. Yeah. No, we need to keep an eye on that because that's like significant. It's one of the only two sites that we have yeah, in yeah, the yeah. region. Yeah. Thank you. Council Roll. I think um, Council Lacey received a benefit from Jupiter's in the day as well, didn't you? <laughs> Probably quite a different funding. Uh, no, no. Different funding? <laughs> yes, I think so. Did quite you quite a meeting exact application, I think very short. And you don't received. know what you're talking about. No idea what you're talking about. Might have been where you were staying the other day. Uh, Councillors, any other business? So just that um, at the LJT conference, we, as you know, we have elected a new um, a new president, and um, I think it'd be worth it worthwhile us inviting Mark here as soon as we can and to send him a letter of congratulations um, on his election. Um, yeah, I think he's um, you know, can be a pretty worthwhile partner and. Um, uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be advantageous, I think, for us to get on the front foot. Got him up to the hold. And I'll sprint your boy, what's he come home? He was. He knows the way. Yeah, he does know the way. Um, and he was, um, it was um, uh, for those who haven't had the opportunity of seeing an election there, those both the candidates had an opportunity of, uh, of putting their cases uh, to, the, to the conference. And an election as well subsequent to that. And, uh, Councillor Jemison and Councillor Ray Brown uh, were the two candidates, both very, very worthy candidates. And um, obviously the LGO is in good hands for the next uh, term of office. Um, but certainly he uh, made it quite clear to us, I suppose, in, in the lobbying that uh, candidates can do, that uh, uh, if he was elected, that um, he'd certainly like to uh, visit the area. And obviously uh, he always uh, made the remark that he was from Springshore. And, uh, he'd like to come home and get another look around. So I uh, appreciate that, Council Bell. We can send that invitation. Sorry, well, it's actually Ryan, but anyhow, we'll split here, will we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've got another one other thing here. One other. Um, if, the, if our Council could send a letter of congratulations, very well okay. to Greg Hoffman, please. Yeah, we're working on that now. Yeah. Oh, good. yeah. We actually thought we might go a little bit further and uh, uh, I know I'm catching the mayor will run here a bit, but possibly with a joint uh, letter signed by the former mayor and the current mayor. Um, both have letters uh, to his wife and a fitting uh, letter from uh, uh, myself on behalf of the managers in the organisation as well. So a couple of letters, both have letters and a nice card, something along those lines. Uh, we'll definitely do that properly. I hope he's not listening because if he's listening, he'll no. just fall. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's too busy to still. I'll go and let him go to the last time. Yeah. Yeah. No, we'll certainly do that. I'll 
the, on the back of the conference too, I don't know if it's worth uh, sending some offers of invitation to some of the councils that we met. Um, possibly some in the southeast corner who don't really know what we do out here. Namely, uh, it's Twitch and uh, Redlands. You know, just extend that invitation to to the councils to come out if they wish to see uh, how our council operates. And then any others that anyone can identify because it's just trying to build those networks and when you sit them up at the meeting and, and see how it all operates, you, uh, I think that a few more in the southeast should have an understanding of what we actually do, especially when the, uh, the comment is, are we throwing bad money, uh, good money after bad out there trying to keep you blokes going? But can, I, can I just add to that that in a, in re, in a recession, or no, I actually was in the um, session, was it? Finance. But they the um, they were using our financials, Central Harvest Regional Council financials as examples. So um, I think that Ipswich yeah, right. and Redlands were a bit taken aback. And obviously, as a roundup of the conference, I appreciate very much. And as I said, so this will be up all the councils, the opportunity, council all the opportunity to go here. Yeah, it was uh, yeah. certainly well worth it and uh, an excellent uh, networking opportunity. Um, well, councillors, um, council, before we ask our visitors to leave, I guess we'll be going to play a session now. Uh, chairman of the Communities uh, Standing Committee, uh, Charlie Brim will come in, might run through the pace of your meeting, Charlie. Oh. I'll do a quick pricey, a uh, quick rundown. I doubt I'll miss something, and or any that I do miss, my apologies. Um, in our meeting actions, um, we've had a letter back from the uh, Minister um, as far as the Tim Fields postcode saying that, that will stay the same. Um, we can progress that further ourselves, but uh, as far as the Minister goes, um, he would like to keep that the same, but I said, uh, for our, our communities, uh, as they would like to be recognised as separate towns. Um, we're getting our information report back on that uh, and further consultation with those, those communities. Um, within the, uh, our consultation notes, uh, the CRMs, uh, the question was put on, on how our CRMs work um, as to whether go with an action with our, our community consultations as opposed to our um, community reference groups. Um, if there's a, a uh, issue that pops up, how is that handled? Um, do we get back to people? So we're looking at uh, improving that system as far as the CRM, so customer request management system. The uh, telecommunications black spot uh, strategy, um, that's been approved. Um, looking at a strategic approach for black for the uh, black spot, um, how we identify those, uh, where they're going, um, and we've also identified four, five, five um, areas or five points which um, we would like uh, up upgraded within that that um, black spot funding. The, uh, there's been a change of use. Um, uh, for 11 Burn Street, uh, making it a little, towards making it a uh, art precinct. Uh, pre um, so the um, so also questions as to to what was to uh, happen with the old building there. The Blackwater Aquatic uh, Committee was established as to look up look at uh, handling um, any um, issues that. that Crop up and can, able, uh, can handle it quickly. Um, there's a further note which um, I'll get through. In. Uh, uh, there's a uh, mobile ablution uh, facility. We're looking at buying uh, uh, disabled toilets. Um, two of those from memory. Two, I hope. Just one. one at this stage. One, sorry. Uh, which uh, so for, for events which need that, that um, disabled toilet, um, that's uh, uh, something we can do in kind. Uh, the uh, Rotary Park fence at Blackwater, um, that was okay for the Rotary to go ahead and um, 
uh, redo that fence on that park. The creative, uh, creative cultural uh, future strategy was um, also um, uh, okay. Uh, it's a community-driven strategy uh, uh, with, and uh, with a strategic direction and also identified for heritage. Uh, the Blackwater Aquatic Centre update, uh, we had that, uh, just looking at um, how it, it was progressing with the um, shade now over the over one half of the, of the 50 metre pool as well as the 25 metre pool. Um, so from the um, uh, photographs, it's certainly looking very good. Uh, looking at uh, having a soft opening, as, um, as in uh, when the pool is possibly going to be open, uh, for people, for local residents, which will be the uh, 26th of January, looking at that possibility, uh, and for a hard, one of the hard, hard um, dates, as in the actual official opening, and, and that's I'll leave that one open. The 